Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Debakey CV Live. My name is Edward Andreos. I'm a second year fellow. And my name is Manny Rojo, and I'm a fourth year integrated vascular resident. First, we would like to introduce our guests and thank them for being here with us. Uh, first is Dr. Thomas Lowe, an attending vascular surgeon here at Houston Methodist Hospital. And second, uh, Dr. Charudara Bavari, an, an attending vascular surgeon, also here with us at Houston Ma uh, Methodist Hospital. Thank you guys for being here. Of course. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, so just a brief introduction as to the title of our episode is actually a derivative of Captain of the Ship Doctrine, uh, coined after a 1969 Supreme Court case, McConnell versus Williams. In this case, the obstetric surgeon handed over the care of a newborn infant to an unexperienced intern. Who later, on, who later on went to cause irreversible damage, negligent irreversible damage to the intern. The outcome of the case and the verdict was that the surgeon is ultimately responsible for everything that happens in the operating room. Now, as we know, a surgeon's role extends not only to the patient, not only in the operating room, but also outside. However, with that, there has been a rise in the, in the popularity of multidisciplinary care. We rely on many of our specialists to help us care for our patients, such as our anesthesiologists, without whom we cannot do what we, can, what we do in the operating room. They help us maintain hemodynamic stability and allow us to do the amazing things that we do. Also, on the floors, our primary care physicians allow us to take care of medically complex patients. And with that, however, with multiple specialists caring for our patients, it's important not to abdicate the responsibility that we ulti ultimately have for our patients. Um, the colloquial term, the buck stops here, popularized by President Harry Truman, was adopted by our specialty and ingrained in our minds as trainees. And the point was to foster ownership of our patients. And although we have multiple specialists, we ultimately feel the responsibility to take care of our, our patients through and through. For some of us, that may mean intricate operative planning, in addition to checking the laps and vitals from home, and but most importantly, enduring with our patients during hardships and suffering with them during complications. Now, nowhere more is that realized than life as an attending surgeon, where the safety net is no longer there. Manny, can you walk us through the structure of our talk tonight? Yes, so as Edward pointed out, what we're talking about today is life as an attending. And the title of our talk, Becoming an Attending, talks about this transition of going from a resident to an attending or a fellow to an attending. As residents and fellows, we can only really imagine what life as an attending is. And perhaps this imagination that we have is true, perhaps it's not. Uh, today we have two guests that are gonna talk about life as an attending. Uh, Dr. Lowe is an attending uh, that finished his residency about a year ago and is a year out into practice. And uh, Dr. Bavari is an attending that finished uh, approximately seven years. So he's seven years out of training. And we want to get their perspective about this. We want to get uh, kind of the nitty gritty of life as an attending and how that compares to our idea of what life as an attending is um, as residents. So we're going to start off uh, with a series of questions. And these questions are going to be directed uh, kind of at both of you. So we want to kind of start from the beginning, and I think one of the biggest uh, choices that somebody uh, makes going from a resident or fellow to an attending is the choice of going into academics or private practice. And I think those are the big uh, kind of the, that's the big fork in the road initially. Uh, and I'll I'll start with uh, with Dr. Lowe. So he made the decision to go into a practice where he didn't have residents and uh, is out in the community. Uh, Dr. Lowe, can you tell us a little bit about that and how you made that choice and, and what led you to, to make that choice? I know, absolutely. Um, I, I think one of the biggest misnomers actually probably in going into practice is that there is really just academics or just private practice. Um, there's really a great scale between those two um, and I, my practice falls kind of squarely into that. I'm a part of the, the Bakey Heart and Vascular Center, um, but I'm not physically in the medical center. I'm not part of the day-to-day, -day, but I'm a part of a much larger entity. Um, I still 
do quite a bit of quality things. I do some research things, um, but it's not a primary part of my day-to-day -day practice. I don't have residents here, at least as of right now. Um, but uh, it's it, it's kind of fits what I was looking for when I was looking for a job. Um, most jobs were like this. Um, they were not. There were not that many true blue academic appointments out there. Uh, they certainly existed. Um, and then there were quite a few private jobs, but there were a lot of these hybrid privademics is what they're kind of often referred to on the interview trail, um, where it's some combination of the two where you'll be in private practice, but have residents cover your service, um, either just at night or during, uh, uh, just uh, for the cases or sometimes even the entire service line, but you truly are not financially entangled with uh, a residency or a hospital system. Um, for me, uh, I, I knew that uh, I enjoy teaching, I enjoy working on these things, but a large part of what I want to do is build um, a practice uh, from the ground up. Uh, that was something that I knew that I would enjoy and wanted to do in terms of survey community. Um, and I thought that taking on residents was uh, going to make that challenging because it is more than just uh, people being with you during the cases. It's you, There's a lot of legwork outside of that. And I didn't think it would be fair to trainees for me to be distracted from that uh, primary focus as well of their education uh, with me disappearing constantly to be building and doing kind of other things related to my practice. That's fair. And, and speaking of, of which, as Dr. Lowe mentioned, Dr. Bavari, so part of the advantages of being in an academic practice is that you do have residents and you do have that support. Now, Dr. Bavari, you went from you know, graduating out of fellowship, you went into private practice for a while, but then now are in an academic center. So can you walk us through how that resident support plays into, for example, your expectation of, uh, you know, working in an academic center and how much does that add or take away from patient care, in your opinion? I think, well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me on this panel. I mean, it, it means a lot for you all to ask me because it, it, it tells us tells me that you know there is something that you think I might add to the conversation so I, I think to answer your question Eddie the I think in my practice coming from a private practice into this academic practice that we have going on right now I think residents are invaluable in my team and I keep telling my patients the same thing you know if somebody is grateful for a procedure, grateful for an outcome, I say, well, it's part of the, it's the whole team that makes it happen because it truly does. It takes a lot off my shoulders for emergencies, phone calls, have, being the first responders, so to speak, for our practice. And you all do carry a big burden and you all do it well. I think re having a resident definitely adds more comfort to my care, knowing that I have a second set of hands to always help me there is uh, always a second mind to bounce ideas off and answer questions and then residents also keep us on our toes because you know you ask questions sometimes to which we don't have answers to and it all also makes us uh, go up read more come back and then uh, substantiate what we have to teach you okay thank you for that and uh, just to, to play devil, devil's advocate dr low if you can play a, a counter argument and say well what's the advantage of not having residents as, as i can I, as i can imagine and again you can answer this however which way you want you know with a, an attendings experience you know you are the first person to hear about a, a patient issue you're less likely to miss something that's important perhaps your surgeries are faster you know, if you can walk us through the advantages of, for example, of not having residents, and, you know, I think we have a balanced view here. So I, I've told uh, Dr. Bavari this before, but personality-wise, I, I have always seen myself more closely aligned with him than probably any of my or other faculty that I trained under, um, because there is a certain control factor of that. And I shared that with him, that I, I understand sometimes the frustration that I saw from our faculty in terms of exactly what you're talking about, not being that first set of eyes. And that is one advantage in terms of you, you shortcut some of that communication. Um, on the other hand, you are the first person to take that phone call from the emergency room. Um, that's every odd hour of the night or evenings. Um, but you do get that immediacy and that immediate connection with the referring providers, uh, with the nursing staff directly. Um, and so there's a certain level of trust that 
that can develop more quickly because you're the only person that they're interfacing with instead of ne not necessarily obviously our vascular residents are on the service a lot in the medical center but there are a lot of visiting residents and so sometimes there's that buffer layer that can be challenging um, to to take on um, so one of the i think the biggest advantage in a practice especially one that's trying to grow and establish a foothold in, in a new community is uh, you get a single message out of this is who we are this is what we're trying to do this is the level of care that we're trying to provide um, without um, kind of a, a buffer if you will that, that that protects you from a lot of it at night but then also detracts from this singular focus and singular level of care and um, there's no question that residents add to a, a service line um, and certainly allow you to do more and definitely keep you on your toes a lot more. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think in certain environments, it, it can be a little bit of hindrance, at least initially, um, when you're trying to get things off the ground. And Dr. Bavari, uh, you went from private practice where you were out there by yourself kind of managing everything and then went into academics. And clearly now, you know, as you stated, you, you see an advantage to having residents and, and it's something that you enjoy. Uh, but was that always the case? And that those first few uh, weeks or first few months going from being the, the solo practitioner out in the community to now coming and having a whole team of residents, how was that transition? Uh, was that a difficult adjustment or uh, was that something that just came uh, fairly naturally to you? It's a, it's a great question and I'm sure a lot of people in their careers will have this transition either uh, from academic to private or private to academic, each has its own, uh, you know, uh, little nitty gritty to, to, to overcome. But I think my, my, my biggest, my biggest emotion when I came in and I joined the group was of relief. Relief because my job in Huntsville was, it's a, it was a group practice, but I was the only vascular surgeon in the practice. I had a great uh, referral base of nephrologists, uh, podiatrists, there was a good bone care center, etc. But obviously I was the only first call and only call. So I had to go in for everything. And when I, when I had uh, patients on dialysis, I had to make a 40 minute drive one way to go and put a dialysis catheter, which took about 15 to 20 minutes mostly, and then come back another 40 minutes to, to home. And when I came to Methodist and I when was part of the residency program, man, that was the biggest relief is I don't have to drive in for all this now. <laughs> I have this wonderful set of hands who are going to be, you know, the first call for all this. And I honestly, in, I, I, I realized that I wanted to have residents. I wanted to have colleagues who I can talk to, I can uh, bounce ideas off and share thoughts about our field. And I missed that in, in Huntsville. I had, a, I had a good group. I did a lot of general and vascular, but I missed the vascular discussions. And so when I came back, this transition was actually I, something I wanted. And I think the more you want a transition, the easier it is to step into that transition. The, the, more, the less you want it, the harder it is. And uh, what I took out of my initial few months is I used to double check all the labs and I used to look at all the studies. I still do, but obviously there is a lot more uh, trust and a lot more laid back attitude that I've had now, uh, considering that I started from private to a residency program. Uh, but to answer your question, overall, I think it was a feeling of relief and a feeling of welcome back to home and a welcome back to the place that I really wanted to be. Yeah. And speaking of transitions, uh, Dr. Lowe, you're you're fresh out. You. We're curious, you know, uh, Manny's going into his fifth year. Uh, I have a, you know, less than a month to graduate. What was your first week as an attending like? Uh, my first week, I'm trying to remember. We, we had, my, my first case was helping my, the, one of the our cardiac surgeon put a patient on ECMO. <laughs> So baptism by fire, if you will. Um, so that was that was a Friday night, and I asked, so do if I scrub into the operating room, I don't even have the ability to post cases, but am I allowed to scrub in to help? And they said, well, no one's going to stop you. So no, I, I mean that that's basically how my week started, and then it went from there. Um, I had known that I was coming up this direction for a long time. I had laid a lot of groundwork in this area. Um, so my first week was 
uh, s- several clinic patients, but it was it was feeling out the area and feeling out the hospital and the people involved in it because it's it's not. Um, it, even though I'd been up here, I'd known the area quite well. It was not something that it was the people that were unfamiliar to me. It was how the referral networks are. It's who talks to who. It's who's um, taking care of different people at different times in their uh, trajectories. And that part took a long while. It was more than just the first week for sure. Um, but no, for me, it was baptism by fire, unfortunately. Yeah, most of us imagine our first week being a little bit slow, uh, as, as, as we no. would hope that it would be, but I guess it wasn't for you. Uh, briefly, uh, we are joined by Dr. Uh, Sean Wengerter, who just joined us right now. You can see he's let it up. So I'm sure he had uh, he was quite busy in the past uh, few hours. But uh, just to introduce him, he's the uh, System Vascular Surgery Division Chief uh, for the Boston Core Healthcare System, uh, part of the Westchester Medical Center System. Welcome, Sean. Thanks for having me. Sorry for being late. <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, to get you up, actually, uh, to get you in the conversation, um, we went to med school together. I know for you know you wanted to be a vascular surgeon from the beginning in fact you actually wanted to be a big academic vascular surgeon yet you ended up going into private practice uh can you tell me about sort of the transition how that happened for you and you know what in residency helped guide you towards the private practice uh sector rather than going into academics yeah um i think um i was balancing I wanted to put myself in a position where I was going to be most successful. And I think that's a balance of the professional setting you're in and also the personal setting that you're in. And for me, um, location was a big, a big, big deal. Uh, My wife and I both uh, grew up in Northern Bergen County and we wanted to stay in this area. Obviously we went, we we went to med school in Newark together and uh, then I was at Sinai in the city. So that was a big, um, location was a big issue, uh, and then because location is a constraint, then the academic jobs that are available is a constraint. Um, and after being in the city in training, um, I didn't think that that lifestyle was conducive to uh, the family life that I wanted to maintain as well, which I thought would negatively downstream affect my professional life. So I was seeking the best balance of both worlds. Thankfully, um, I had a lot of early exposure. My father's a vascular surgeon, um, trained in the Monty program under Beef, and I was exposed to it pretty early. I saw him in the academic setting, and then later on, midway through his career, transitioned into the private practice setting. So I kind of knew that in private practice, you could still be somewhat academic, have a um, residence fellows, which, you know, him working at Englewood with Dardick. Um, they had a fellowship uh, and we participate. That's one of the hospitals we go to and we participate at. Um, so I knew that you could have um, aspects of the things that I love most about academic uh, affiliation and academic uh, career, which is mostly teaching and interaction with fellows. So with that said, this private practice gave me a uh, opportunity to collaborate with or is giving me an opportunity to collaborate with the the uh, vascular surgeons at Westchester, and we're in the process, the very, very early stages, talks of starting a fellowship, a combined fellowship between the two of us. Um, so I think I've been able to, you know, get the best of both worlds. Very good. Um, I'd like to transition a little bit uh, to kind of life as an attending, because. As residents, we have an idea of what life as an attending is, and our life as residents uh, certainly uh, can be difficult, and and we we have, uh, you know, patients that we care for a lot, that we take a a lot of pride in caring for and a lot of ownership for, but uh, the life as an attending must be a, a higher degree to that, the ownership that an attending must take for their patients, and and, and in their care uh, is, is an, a degree above that. So I, I remember my first complication as a, as a junior resident and, and kind of how hard that was on me and, and how impactful that was. Uh, but I'd like to transition a little bit into your first complication as an attending. 
and how that was different uh, than your complications in residency and how you handled that. Uh, and we can start with Dr. Bavari to, to kind of talk about uh, his first complication. And you don't have to go into details, of course, but just, just how it impacted you and how you handle that differently as an attending. I was hoping you wouldn't start with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, you know, any complication is, is bad, right? As, you know, as a resident, as, a, as an attending. But I think I keep I, my, my, job, my uh, joke on this one used to be that, you know, as a resident, we have, um, a you know, complication becomes a slide on the mortality morbidity report. But as an attending, it becomes a scratch or a scar on your uh, on your on yourself because you take it as that it's a little more it's a little more um, serious i think or at, at least we perceive it a little, a little more seriously my first complication was a failure of a fistula creation in the operating room and as simple as it may sound i really took it to heart is you know i had all this training i was trained by all the, the people that uh, experts in fact one of our uh, you know, faculty, Dr. Eric Peden is was the, one of the leaders in the United States on dialysis access. You know, like having been trained by him, I could do such a you know, bad job in this case. But uh, then the next case came along is the same day I have, an, I have a case after that. And it's just like the board exams where you come to the room, you have a bad or a somewhat okay case, but then you have to switch off and then go on to the next one. You have to have a mindset of okay, you did something bad, you will learn from it, you quickly go on to the next one, you know, brush off whatever bad humors you have on your mind. Uh, and then as as life goes on, you will, we will have more and more cases that don't go according to our plan or don't go according uh, to the expected plan. But uh, uh, I think I still take it to heart when something goes really bad. Um, but the small complications now are big learning. Uh, learning projects for me to see what went wrong. I always keep asking why, why, why. And then if something goes wrong, there has to be a reason why. Find the reason and then fix it for the next time. Of course, and I think as many mentioned, um, you know, we, we do take complications very, very, very personally as residents, but you can only surmise, at least we could, uh, how difficult you could take this complication as an attending, especially that there wasn't anybody to double check you, and at the end of the day, uh, it was your call. Uh, at this moment, I'll just take a brief moment to mention that if you have any questions, any of our viewers, uh, please feel free to text DeBakey to 37607 any point, or go to polev.com and enter uh, DeBakey at any point. Uh, pivoting back to our talk, so I guess, speaking of complications, and coming out of, uh, fresh out of residency or fellowship, are there any cases that you should not be doing or you should not be taking on early on in your career? And I'll direct this question to Dr. Wengerter and Dr. Lowe. If you, Dr. Lowe, would you like to go first? Yeah, no, that, that's a really tough one. I mean, I, I, I was actually just having this discussion with my father yesterday about different cases that I would take on at the hospital I'm at and not. And one of the points that, that he made to me as a physician is if you don't do it in your first year into practice, the likelihood of you taking that on down the line drops off precipitously because not only do you not have the practice of doing that, but also you, you become a little gun shy in terms of it's not a part of my practice. Now all of a sudden I'm taking it on, what it happens if I have a complication, things like that. And I had said, even when I came into practice, I, I'm not gonna do open aortas electively at least, um, if I'm not forced to uh, here at this hospital, that I would send them to my partners or I would come down to the medical center and do them. Um, but then I have a, a senior cardiac faculty that did, we did an open aneurysm my first, what was it, six weeks into practice here, right? And a uh, patient did well, um, but having that comfort of having a senior surgeon working with me through the case and and I think that's the main thing, right, is that it's not that you shouldn't do it, but you should have appropriate backup, um, appropriate mentorship for those cases. And if, if he weren't here, 100% that I would have called up Dr. Bavari and said, hey, um, do you mind if this patient can come down to the medical center? I may come down and, and double scrub it with you. Try not to get in the fellow or the, the residence way too much, um, but probably do this down in the medical center um, where there's appropriate backup and support. Um, 
I did the same thing with my carotids up here. Um, and then of course, on my first carotid, Dr. Duval ended up in an emergency uh, cabbage. And I did my first carotid without uh, my senior uh, partner in the room, uh, even though that's what I had kind of laid out and planned to do my first several carotids with um, a senior partner around at least. Um, but otherwise, unfortunately, the bigger cases that I've been involved in have been emergencies and things that I said, uh, I'm not really looking to bite this off in the first couple of months, but you, you get forced into those situations. And when you've been trained, the answer is always yes and will help. Sometimes you can end up in those types of situations. Dr. Weingerter, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I, I completely agree. I think it's uh, really important to know. Uh, I think we're all obviously uh, well trained, uh, but it's important to know. Oh, looks like we lost Dr. Weingarter. Hopefully we'll try to get him back shortly and, uh, and have him complete his thought. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we can move on to our, our next topic, which is uh, how to establish a practice. Uh, something we don't know much about, or at least we don't learn much about in residency and fellowship is you know, how do you, how do you go from, uh, you know, resident and fellow where, you know, oh, you show go. up, oh, we got Dr. Wengerter back. Oh, uh, hey, poor Zoom etiquette. I know. <laughs> um, I, I completely, uh, completely agree. I think the, the point I, you know, reiterate here is really know your location, what hospital you're in. Um, I have, you know, we have, uh, you know, uh, Places where we can do certain procedures, and then smaller hospitals where it's not appropriate. Um, I, you know, make sure that if I feel it's necessary, involve uh, senior faculty more so in the beginning of things uh, to make sure that um, you have the appropriate backup. And the key is being safe, balancing wanting to, you know, show the skill set that you, you know, uh, built over the prior five, you know, eight years, what have you. Um, you also want to be safe, and that's the, the important part in choosing who your partners are going to be and what type of practice you're going into. You want to make sure that they're, the practice is conducive to that and they support that, uh, that they'll, they'll give you support when you need it um, and also let you go out on your own and not keep you on too tight of a leash. Um, and I think uh, for me, the most important thing is knowing your location and what the capabilities of the hospital that you're in. Uh, with that patient and if you need to as it was mentioned bring it to an academic center to do it um, in a coordinary care center i think that's you know when it's needed that decision needs to be made the key is just being safe for the patient dr bavari uh, when you started practice you were out in the community and you, you mentioned you were the only vascular surgeon uh, in your practice and so you were in a group of uh, with another general surgeon uh, and now that you're here at the medical center uh, in academics, you kind of do the, the entire breadth of vascular surgery, anything from fenestrated uh, endografts to thoracic outlet. And was that always the case? And out in the community, what, uh, how did you choose what cases to do and what cases not to do? And uh, would you have any advice for young attendings, things, maybe specific cases to stay away from when they're out in the community? But that's a great, great question, and it always comes up on everyone's mind whenever you're starting off. Is what should I do? What should I not do? There is always a bigger list of what I should not do or what I should be careful about, and there is a small list of things that uh, you're comfortable or you're confident of taking on. Uh, case selection is the key, and you know, although I had great ambitions of doing an open aortic case in Huntsville, <clears throat> I kept that ambition off for a year till I knew exactly what we were capable of. Uh, I must say one of my part, one of my partners, the senior most partner in the practice, was actually a trained cardiac surgeon who had done an, a non-accredited fellowship uh, at Texas Heart, <clears throat> and his ambition was to become a cardiac surgeon, but he chose to do more general. So actually, he did have some vascular, you know, uh, skill set, and he did a, a fair amount before I went there too. So I had someone to help me. The question about what should we do and what should we not do, honestly, I completely agree with Sean. You've got to know the place. You have to know the practice. You have to know what suits the practice best. And you, need, you have to have somebody who is slightly more experienced than you are, or maybe a lot more experienced than you are, who could guide you if, the, if, if time comes, and especially in times of trouble. You know, one, one advice I would have is for anyone going to a new place, the, the, one of the best ways to scout what really happens there is talk to the local reps. 
they are the boots on the ground in those hospitals they know the inside stories sometimes they know a little too much but they know most of what goes on normally and they can give you a good uh, idea about what's the flavor of the place so when this advice was given to be to me by you know alan lumsden when our chairman here at Houston methodist and I, I and i cannot disagree it's actually one of the best resources to have one of the local reps uh, for your reps to talk to one of the local reps there that's one uh, to further answer your question about uh, what cases did I do, you know, my Huntsville Hospital had built a new cath lab around the time when I joined. It is a it's a beautiful imaging system out there, and so people were like, okay, you're, are you going to try to do uh, carotid stenting? And I said, no, we will try to do fistulograms. That's the first thing we would do, and so that's what I started off. Small cases which I was expecting to be, you know, least involved or less involved than it than it could be. And then we transitioned to developing a team. We had a workflow, and eventually I ended up doing about 18 uh, EVARs over the course of three years out there. So, so I mean, you have to sort of build up your game there. You have to start start small, think small, but always keep the ambition of doing something big, but knowing what limitations the place has. And the critical component is a good ICU system, a good uh, you know support system for your post-operative care because you know more than more often than not our patients do badly not interrupt but post op uh, certainly uh, knowing your limitation is is key in medicine and and with that uh, transition to our next topic is how how do you build your practice from scratch something we don't get taught much in medical school residency or fellowship is that you you know your first day on the job you're not going to show up to a full clinic uh, where your uh, fenestrated cases have all been you know medically optimized and risk stratified awaiting your arrival so if you can walk us through sort of uh, Dr. Lowe and Dr. Wengerter uh, how you established your practice how you built it up and what did you have to do to get the, the practice that you had in mind uh, back when you were in residency or fellowship? No, that's a really good question. I mean, um, it, it's actually very straightforward where I'm at. The answer is always yes. And, and this goes back to what Dr. Bavaro was talking about of knowing what resources you have. The one big kind of ace in the hole for me has always been in my practice is I have access to the medical center and the vascular surgery team there, right? So whether it's advice just over the phone or if it's the bailout for sending it down to the medical center, as long as I'm willing to come in and see the patient, evaluate them, I can be a really good resident and get the patient to the right place. Um, and that's a, not a small thing, right? I, I have the ability to simply say yes to everything. Um, obviously, if it's something that needs to be life flight or directly sent to the medical center, that's a different story, um, but I can still take that phone call. Um, and so that's been the single biggest calling card for my practice is, there, there is no such thing as a bad consult. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, if I can't handle it or if it's something that is not appropriate for a vascular surgeon, I'll help you find the right person for you. And so once you get known as someone that can simply solve whatever problem it is someone's consulting you for, whether it's a, today I got a consult for a splenic infarct and what was the other one? Sacral decubitus injury. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of stuff that the primary vascular surgeon doesn't need to take care of, but anytime someone thinks of a wound, they, they consult me as the vascular surgeon. Um, and that, that's how you grow your practice. And if you want to do venous insufficiency, if you want to do arterial um, insufficiency, that's where you, if you get known as the wound person, those consults start to come in. The podiatrists get to know who you are. The cardiologists get to know who you are. Um, for dialysis access, uh, I, like Dr. Bavari, felt very comfortable um, although my, I didn't mention it, but my first complication was also dialysis related and it made me second guess everything about, <laughs> I learned over seven years in residency. Um, but um, there's very little that I feel like I can't say yes to in that realm. Um, and at the same time, I have that bailout of, I, I can call it my partners in the medical center saying, hey, I, I, this, is, this person's more complicated than we can handle up here. Uh, do you mind taking a look at their chart and come from there? But the ability to just simply say yes and knowing I have that backup. Um, and sometimes it's reverting to the role of, I'm just the gatekeeper. And I've said that to, to patients where I say, I'm, I'm a vascular surgeon seeing you, but I'm not your surgeon. I'm not the right person to take care of you, but I'm gonna help you find the right person has been, again, the number one calling card for our practice to build up here. Certainly. Uh, Dr. Wenger, what was your view uh, and of this process starting up? Well, I think 
starting even before you walk in the door or you sign the contract, you have to know what the practice is you're walking into or you're choosing to walk into. For me, um, I was walking into a four uh, a four man practice in Rockland County, New York, which is a suburb of New York City uh, that services pr primarily two hospitals, but in total four. Um, and one of those, um, sorry, there were three three surgeons, um, and one of those surgeons was leaving. Um, so there was somewhat of a practice that I I knew that I would be walking into. So there's a benefit there, obviously. I'm sure the, uh, the many of the fun fun cases would be skimmed off the top, but there was there there was a there was a decent amount of patients for the first few uh, you know when I first started to see in the office, and I, I think you know it's that alliterative uh, kind of uh, saying that you know affable available. I mean that's all that we're saying. You have to be available. You answer your phone. You give your card out. You give your phone number. You go try to be in the hospital physically. Um, as much as possible and see, you know, meet, meet all the hospitalists, meet all the primary care docs, uh, meet the nephrologists, make sure they know who you are very early on and get your number out there, your contact info. And uh, big thing that uh, some of the referring docs, you know, said to me that helped me build up fast is, and my senior partners, you know, reinforced on me was that you have to call them. My senior partner walked me through his, his day in the OR. He operates, he finishes his case, he walks the patient to the PACU, he sits down in the uh, bay of computers, calls the primary care doc or the referring physician, the cardiologist, tells him how the surgery went, calls the family, and he does the same thing every time. In his office hours, he sees the patient, he writes the note, he gets his dictaphone out, and he dictates a, a, a letter to the referring docs CCing the primary care docs and, and whoever is necessary. And I took on basically his paradigm and I've had multiple primary care docs, nephrologists, everyone say, I love getting those letters. I love getting the updates because they have so much going on. If they have someone who's available in their face, managing their patients, taking over that responsibility for them aggressively and actively, they will just keep sending you patients. The word spreads. That's really helpful advice. Uh, the thing that I didn't really want to buy in first, uh, first was that, that dictaphone because it seems so old school, you know, and kind of uh, not, uh, you know, epic, you know, or, you know, some other EMR can generate those letters, but the, they love those dictated letters and it really, I think that does go far. That may not fit for everyone, but the point is the communication and, you know, almost constant contact with, with the referring docs. Those are all great pieces of advice, and uh, that's Sorry, kind of... Manny, real quick before yeah. you move on. Go ahead. So I, I want to echo on that. I mean, I find that to be one of the most important things. And going back to your original question of residents or no residents in your practice, um, that's a big part. That's something that I would have difficulty giving up control from is because if you're relegating op note writing, things like that, it's very easy to, to take a step back and not and lose that connection with your referring base. and. Um, that that's everything is having that communication with those referring doctors and developing those relationships. Um, and no, I do the exact same thing. I, I scribble my op note. I take a picture of the, the diagram of whatever I did, and that gets sent immediately to the referring doctor and the dialysis unit or the dialysis nurses or whoever it is that's been sent that's referring the patient and so they know that no not only did we do this but oh, if there's wrong. something going on my number is on there you, you call me because i want to know um and then once they feel comfortable that you're taking care of the patient and the problem that they sent you for the, the more patients follow and then you know if i may add to this uh, guys i mean i would echo the exact thing sean thomas i would say the same thing and it's it's easy or I, I would say it, it's hard to do in any kind of practice private or academic it takes a lot of discipline to keep doing it it some people do it in the beginning and then you kind of fade away and ah, oh, yeah i'm getting all these referrals so it, it's easy to be complacent but i would say not just starting but even towards ending as sean's senior partner does every single time keep that uh, habit and it's surprising you'll see it's it's actually shockingly surprising how few surgeons actually send back feedback to the referring docs, docs or the referring uh, uh, consultants. And it's, it's a great step to, to do it. And I, I try to do it as much as I can. I'm not perfect, 
but uh, the, every clinic patient gets a note sent to the referring docs. I and will say I sent it down a T card patient to Dr. Bavari, and I got a nice text message with an Anjo saying thank you for referring the patient. <laughs> so and that's that's important, uh, you know, between specialists when we refer patients to each other. Um, you know, a, a little anecdote. I was in I was in Greece on vacation with my my uh, family uh, in the last last summer, and I got a I got a, a text message from a cardiologist. I called them up and I uh, was talking to them, and because uh, I had internet in, uh, in, uh, in where I was, and I was talking to them on uh, WhatsApp or whatever, and we're going through everything, they're like, so uh, are you gonna be around tomorrow? I said, no, I'm in Greece right now, but, and they're like, oh my God, go back, get from point A to point B and what they need to do for their patient. And on a related note, uh, this one's for Dr. Bavari, so we kind of talk about building that practice initially when you get out into uh, your career, but how about focusing your practice? So one thing that I think a lot of us have dreams about is we have a specific interest and we all understand that when we start practice we're going to kind of have to do everything, right? Um, we, 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 have to, we have to do everything to get proficient at everything, but let's say, uh, Dr. Bavari, you're interested in thoracic outlet or let's say you really want to do TCAR or, or you really want to do fenestrated. There's a specific niche that uh, you want to get into. Um, you, you have been very successful at breaking into those niches like pulmonary uh, thrombectomies and, and thoracic outlet. What, what would be your advice for people wanting to break into a specific focus in vascular surgery? It's a, that's a great question. It, uh, I'm sure it's going to come up on everyone's minds. And I must say that in the beginning when I went in, in private practice, I was actually supposed to do general and vascular. So I kind of kept my ambitions on the back burner. At the same time, I realized that giving up a skill is not going to help. So I, I did everything that came to me. I did everything that I, I mean, I tried to do everything that came to me. The, when I came back to the hospital, you know, there will be cases that suddenly spark something inside you and say, okay, this is something that really excites me or you know, makes me uh, feel very grateful to do. And that may be a spark that, that ignites in you, that will lead you to do something, and that becomes your niche. There could be places where there is a deficiency of a procedure, and you, you just step in. Uh, to, for me, honestly, I did not know. What I do today, I did not know that I would be doing this seven years ago when I finished fellowship. When I finished fellowship, I came out with the, with the notion that, okay, I'm going to do everything, and then maybe I'll get an opportunity to do something. And, most of what I do today, it came by, came by honestly, it did come by a little bit of serendipity and it came by a little bit of interest from my side and encouragement from our senior partners. Okay, not everyone wants to do PE thrombectomy. Not if, trust me, nobody wants to do a thoracic outlet syndrome for sure. And then not many people want to do T cards because it was new, not many people were trained. So that's how I got in. And then I realized that that's a void that I can help fill. And I can, I mean, I am, and I, I'm okay doing it. I'm, I'm good at doing it myself without help. And so that's how my practice is now trying to go. But of course, I still do everything under the sun. Uh, I don't know if that answered the question perfectly, but I think bottom line is somehow uh, most of what you do is by on the job uh, situation and on the job serendipity that guides you. And like I said, there are some cases that ignite a spark inside you and say, okay, this is what I really like to do, and then you pick it up. And that's thoracic outlet syndrome has been that for me. Yeah, sounds like um, pre when preparation meets the perfect opportunity, you just gotta seize it, and, and that's certainly the theme throughout tonight's talk. But uh, if you can pivot our, uh, our focus to the last part of our talk tonight, which is education. So uh, this question goes out to Dr. Wengerter. So now that sort of you're out on your own, you don't have a preset schedule of being a resident or a fellow anymore, how do you stay up to date? Uh, how do you personally stay up to date on the medical literature, on being on all the new procedures, all the new devices? Uh, what, is, what is your go-to and, and what do you recommend for young surgeons uh, fresh out? Well, I try to stay, um, you know, in contact. Uh, well, first of all, being, you know, a suburb of New York City, obviously we have uh, some great opportunities for both small and large uh, conferences. Beep is always a popular thing for us to, it's easy for us to get to. Um, so that's a great way of staying kind of up to date, the Venus Symposium over the, you know, in the spring um, and the various other uh, conferences. Um, 
and staying involved with the local uh, vascular uh, or regional vascular uh, societies. Uh, I'm active with the EBS as much as I can be. Uh, participated in a webinar like this on COVID early on uh, with them, and I presented or did a debate uh, with a uh, vascular society in New Jersey. And you know, going there, seeing the talks, and you know, interacting helps you stay up to date. We do have. Uh, uh, grand rounds are run by some residents at the Englewood, uh, at our Englewood uh, hospital, so that helps uh, being involved with residents there. Uh, you know, I think now with the internet and all the online um, things that are available, like the Methodist uh, YouTube uh, <laughs> channel, I actually, interestingly enough, you know, you mentioned we went to med school together, and I, I went back through our text messages and I contacted you. Uh, uh, about the fact that you were getting famous uh, on the uh, Methodist YouTube uh, page because yeah, I remember I that text. <laughs> I found it, and uh, I was watching the the uh, procedures. I was watching the discussions, and I think it's I think it's great. Things like this are you know very important uh, you know for the whole community, and it's it's one way uh, to to stay up to date on things. In addition to reading and all the other things, but I think the media. And the content that out that's out there now makes it a lot easier. Well, first, thank you for the plug. Uh, we really appreciate it here. And uh, but I, I think it just uh, it's important to to determine and and to sort of keep your mindset, as you mentioned, focused on the fact that you know there's nobody gonna there's nobody that's gonna be sort of looking over your shoulder, and making sure that you continue to read and stay attuned. And you have to be dedicated and motivated. Uh, to be uh, involved uh, with your, as you said, the Vascular Society of New Jersey in your case and in any young surgeon's case, the society in their district, uh, but to continue to remain uh, diligent in maintaining uh, your focus on being up to date in vascular surgery. One other thing I would add is I think, um, you know, I, I just interviewed for uh, ACS over the weekend, and I think, you know, as we as a society and vascular surgeons become have become more and more subspecialized and kind of in many ways, at least in the New York area, separate from general surgery. I think it's so important for all of us to maintain that you know, connection uh, to, to American College of Surgeons and it's a great resource. Uh, that, that's my personal feeling. I think the SCS has done such a good job that you could, you know, many people kind of, um, it could kind of fall to the wayside, but in terms of maintaining you know, advocacy in DC, and educational pathways, I think, it's, I think it's a great resource. Dr. Lowe, do you want to talk a little bit about how you uh, stay up to date with the literature and, and the latest devices and, and keep that education going? Yeah, well, I'm not too far out of training, <laughs> only eight months out. But no, I mean, certainly when I could, um, I was coming to at least virtually the Thursday morning uh, conferences at, at Methodist downtown, um, which is always a good way of hearing cases um, about cases, hearing the discussions about the cases. And then, of course, I ended up with block time uh, Thursday morning, sorry, at 630, and that kind of shut that down pretty quick. Um, but no, I mean, the, the main thing is knowing what resources you have available to you. And like Sean said, I mean, reviewing things online. I've been actually going through almost systematically the uh, boot camp uh, uh, lectures that are on the, the, the device page um, and surprisingly a lot of it's not the vascular things so some of it's the cardiology things that I'm just not as familiar with but I need more familiarity with because it's about devices or it's about management that is ancillary to what I'm doing but something that, that I just didn't focus on in training because I was hyper focused on, on getting the vascular surgery knowledge in and so it's having those resources available and then also um, more formally, hopefully when we're able to, uh, being a more active participant in Southern down here. Uh, Meath has always been my favorite meeting as a trainee um, because it was a lot less presentations on kind of things and it was more senior surgeons across the country telling me this is how I do things, um, which to me speaks a lot more to the, the vision of how should I be practicing, how should I be organizing my thoughts more than here's some little project that we did and doing a lot of those types of presentations. Sure. 
Um, and another part of education to touch on is, is teaching residents, and uh, especially in the operating room. Dr. Bavaria and Dr. Wengerter, you guys uh, both uh, teach residents. Dr. Bavaria at uh, Houston Methodist, Dr. Wengerter at Englewood Hospital. So what are some of the things that you do differently uh, doing a case on your own uh, versus doing a case with a resident. Some of the techniques that have been discussed is you know, making bigger incisions, maybe not looking at the clock often, letting, letting the resident struggle a little bit through the case. Uh, if I can have you uh, both talk a little bit about your approach to teaching residents in the operating room, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Bavari. Uh, I honestly enjoy having a resident with me in the OR. One, because, you know, when I was the fellow, we had, it, you know, you learn a few things. You don't learn everything from every single faculty member. It's impossible, right? So you learn what you get best out of each. And we had one, Hossam El Sayed, who is now at, in uh, Columbus, Ohio. He was the, the Picasso in the operating room because he said, every stitch is important, every cut is important, everything you do is crucial. And so that's what I, you know, ingrained into me. And I guess you all have been, you have burnt, you have, you know, borne the brunt of my wrath in the OR sometimes where I'm like, no, 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 this has to be done this way. So I think as an attending with residents, everyone feels, okay, are you going to give it up? You're never going to give up anything. I think you're just going to make sure that someone does it almost the same way as you want it to be or you're trained to do. And uh, I would, I would, uh, I would discourage anyone from feeling that okay, as an attending, you have to do less or you have to give up something in return. No, it's not that. Actually, it's more enjoyable to impart the knowledge that you think you have to, to somebody else who you think can be trained this way. Um, I don't, I don't look at the clock. I've never done it even in private practice on my own or now in academic practice. I look at the result in the end and I do want the result to be perfect so therefore the steps leading to the result have to be perfect and I'm a big stickler for that. Um, as, an, as a private practice a, a vascular surgeon in Huntsville, um, I had my own mistakes. I, I learned how to deal with them and then I learned how not to make them so that I don't, I don't have to deal with them. So prevention obviously is better than throwing five more stitches and ten more clips everywhere. And uh, I try to impart the same uh, when, I, when I've come here at Methodist Hospital. Uh, it's not a challenge. I think it's, it's more uh, it's beneficial to me because then I learn what people think. I learn what residents tell me, okay, do I, should I do this? Should I do that? Should we, should we do it in this way? Should we make this incision instead of the other one? I think there is a lot to learn. I've learned more as a, a resident supervisor than on my own. I've learned my own stuff on my own, but I've learned more as a resident supervisor. What do you think, Sean? I can't, I agree with everything you said. I think uh, for, for me right now, uh, the, my participation at Englewood uh, is probably only 25, 20% of my practice. The vast majority is at our private hospital where we don't have residents. Um, I had the opportunity through Westchester to get medical students, which I jumped at. So uh, before COVID, we would have resident, uh, medical, a medical student following you around, and that was just fantastic. Um, so I think for me, the fact that it's not a major part of my practice, but it's something that I get uh, occasionally, I, I just love it when I have the opportunity. Um, I think anecdotally for myself, the hardest thing to not give up, as you're saying, but the handover was almost the perm caps <laughs> to, to, the, to the junior residents. I, I was just, uh, you know, <laughs> I think that was the last thing I could give up. Is, uh, is the firm gap, uh, you know, you, when you're sewing in an anastomosis, dissecting out, you, you almost have more control because you're right there with them. And you have to step back and let them do the firm gap. That, that to me was almost uh, the most scary thing. Um, but I, I, that's why I'm working so hard to start a fellowship uh, uh, in conjunction with Westchester because I think it does elevate your game. You know, the, you learn so much from the residents, you learn so much from the fellows, um, and that, going back to education, that helps you grow and keep you honest and keep you growing, you know, because they, they, they're hungry, they're fresh, and they're going to be reading actively and, and, you know, challenging you questions, bring up, you know, how, why can't we do it this way or this, I read about this, and you can rethink it, discuss it, just as you were saying. So I think uh, residents are, you know, fantastic and fellows are fantastic to have, and I love working with chance that 
you just can't look at the clock um, and uh, because you'll go crazy. <laughs> but it, it's fantastic. Work. I mean, it keeps you, it keeps you, I think, on your toes and keeps you fresh. So. Well, that was a really wonderful discussion, uh, and we're kind of headed towards the end of the discussion, and we'd like to open it up now to the final uh, remarks or final advice that you guys will have for uh, fresh attendings coming uh, out of training and into practice. And we'll start with Dr. Lowe. Uh, any, any kind of remarks for, the, for those uh, new attendings? No, I, I think it's just reiterating what we've been talking about. I mean, uh, continuing to be ambitious when you come out is really important to be to strive to do more. But at the same time, knowing your own personal limitations, being humble, um, and knowing what support you have available to you um, is everything. Knowing your hospital and what they are capable of supporting you with and what they feel less comfortable supporting you with is everything. Um, and it, it's sounds so trite but knowing yourself is, is so difficult when you're trying to find a job because as you've highlighted there's you just have limited exposure to a lot of the things that you don't even realize are that important until you get out there um, but as much as you can as far as your personality what you're looking for um, trying to figure out what the, the different jobs and the different partners you're going to have are going to offer you is the only thing you really can do um, and, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of sick patients out there, and there, as a vascular surgery trainee, you are going to take care of a lot of people, and you're going to take good care of them. Um, but it's a matter of putting yourself in a position to, to succeed as well as you can. Dr. Bavari? Yeah, I know me, one thing we did not touch up on, and one, mm -hmm. and that's, it doesn't really apply. Everything is great in the operating room and out and after the operating room. What leads to the operating room is your outpatient practice. Be very mindful that your clinic staff is a huge component of your practice. And uh, I would say, and I guard my clinic staff with my life. Uh, I have not let them change their jobs. They are fantastic and I want to keep them that way. But have a really good respect for your clinic staff because they are the ones who treat, who answer patient phone calls. They are the ones who, you know, troubleshoot when you're in the OR for outpatient, that is. Uh, and, and they'll be the ones helping you get patients into the office. And finally, what you get into the office is what builds your OR practice eventually. So that's one, everything else I think is obviously spoken for itself, but one thing I wanted to chime in on is the clinic staff. Have a good respect for them. Dr. Weingarter? I can't uh, reiterate all, all the points you guys said enough. And, and what you, know, you were just saying, your clinic staff, your outpatient staff, your ultrasound techs, they interface. You don't realize how much they interface with your patients. Uh, so if you have a good relationship uh, with them, they're going to really reinforce a positive uh, perspective on, on the surgeon, yourself, with the patient. That's going to go you know, very far. Um, in terms of preparing yourself, uh, what jobs to choose and your practice, I think you know, what was said, you have to know yourself, uh, know what your goals are, uh, what your expectations are, and really marry your professional and your personal life, and uh, make sure you put yourself in a position to succeed. One of my favorite little reads is, um, I forget the author, I think it's Drucker, uh, uh, Managing Yourself, and it's a, it's a very short thing, but and it talks about the different stages of your career and goal setting and things like that. And you really have to sit down and be honest with yourself, which is one of the hardest things to do. And that will allow you to set yourself up to get where you want to go. Um, and I think that's 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 important. Be safe. Um, be honest with yourself in terms of uh, your surroundings and the, and the, uh, the hospitals you work in. And, and uh, don't be afraid to ask for help from your senior uh senior partners uh, to make sure that you can take care of the patients in the best way possible in your first definite year and in the first you know few stages of your career. Truly great advice. Uh, Dr. Thomas Lowe, Dr. Chardara Bavari, Dr. Sean Warngerter, it was a pleasure to have you on our program and uh, have a wonderful night. Thanks guys. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.